Um, so, as Bruno said, I'm delighted to be here today and I'm with Mount Sinai Hospital. I'm going to try and talk a bit about how we use bioinformatics in a clinical setting because I'm sure there's a lot of people here who are using it in the research setting. Um, I've been very lucky over the years to work with a lot of good people. So, worked initially with Anas and then moved up and worked at the Sanger with, uh, as part of the production. I didn't work with Richard, the Sanger is a very big place, but uh, if I'd followed this way, I would ended up in Virginia with Sean Eddy, but instead I came to Toronto, I'm very happy I did, it's a very nice place. Um, so, personalized medicine, it's being thrown around a lot at the moment. There's a lot of people talking about P4 medicine, mobile health, um, precision medicine, health 2.0. Um, and most of the time these things are followed by, we have a plan to radically improve everything and everything is good and can become better. So what is the reason that everyone is suddenly talking so much about these things? And the other thing which also comes up is this billion dollar market which seems to pop up quite often. So the main driving forces are these kind of four things. We have the big data movement, which is popular among the executive crowds at the moment. We have healthcare costs, cheap sequencing, and the, we're running out of blockbusters. So big data is this movement in the executive crowd that they found out that if you base your decisions on data and information instead of just gut feeling and hearsay, the outcome tends to be more successful. So suddenly everyone wants systems which can tell them what they should do next and try and they've been hoarding up data for years and now they actually want some return on what that information means and, and trying to increase their business productivity. Healthcare cost is kind of skyrocketing. Um, you both have that every year it becomes more and more expensive to treat people, it becomes more complicated people live longer. We have the big problem that there are a lot of people born after the Second World War and they didn't have as many children as themselves, so um, we now don't have enough people to pay the taxes which would be required to maintain the healthcare system we have today. So there's a lot of political forces which want to try and drive healthcare costs down or work smarter or some way. It's kind of coming to a point where it will break, so someone needs to find a better way of doing this. Sequencing, everyone knows about. You can take out your bingo cards now and take off the NIH sequencing cost graph. Uh, it's becoming much cheaper and much more easy to, to sequence people. It's becoming much more feasible. You no longer need a million, billion dollar institute to do sequencing, everything, you just go out and you buy the machine and then the headache starts. And the last thing is that you're, a lot of the big pharmaceutical companies, their drug pipelines are, are drying up. They're kind of coming to this existential crisis where the old way of doing it, where you find a substance, you try it out, you spend about 10 years developing it, and then you do a large randomized trial, and then it gets approved that's kind of stopped working because you now need to develop drugs which are much targeted, you're going after much more specific populations than you did in the past. So, um, so they need means of being able to target their trials better, more easily prove that their drugs work, preferably quicker. Um, so, so we're in an interesting situation. There's a lot of stakeholders who want to push this forward. Industry wants to sell you software for big data. Uh, the government wants to bring the cost of healthcare down and have people use less drugs. The pharmaceutical people, the industry wants people to use more drugs. Uh, and sequencing is charging forward. Um, so even though people disagree about why we're doing it, everyone wants this to move forward. So I thought I would start off by giving a few examples about where we can use personalized medicine today. One of the first examples is something called adverse drug reactions. So once you, when you go come to a hospital and you're given a drug, um, quite often the physician who gives it to you do not know what your family physician or other people have given you or necessarily how that will work for you. For the majority of people it works fine, 
but for quite a lot of people, it can have an adverse effect. To bear in mind that most people who get treated are ill, so they're not necessarily as robust as everyone else, but it means that 30% of all hospital admissions are due to people being treated. So you're trying to make people more healthy, but actually they end up coming back to the hospital. So this is a Guardian article back from 2008 about how the NHS, so the British Health Service, is spending $2 billion a year it didn't have to use because people are getting drugs which are harming them. And the hope of personalized medicine is to try and stop you from getting those drugs in the first place. And there's other banner examples as well. The whole GWAS community loves this one. It's warfarin. It's a blood thinning drug. Um, it's currently, before this discovery was made, you, you were given a dose and then people saw what happened. If, uh, and depending on how you reacted, you got more or less. And then you kind of tried to find the correct dose after a while. When they carried out this GWA study, they found out there's certain genetic markers which defines what your dose should be. So now we can genotype people, we can find out what the right dose, and we can give them. Because before, if you didn't get the drug, you had the risk of having cardiac arrest. If you were given too much of the drug, your blood became too thin and you started leaking into your arteries and you became, had internal bleeding. So it's none of those things you wanted. So you want to hit the right dose for people uh, right off the bat. Another example, and it's also very nice to see exactly, so this is 2000 and I think this is 8, 9, and this is 2010. So it was extremely rapidly adopted. Another thing is, this has, the name of this talk was about bioinformatics in the clinic, but there is a lot of other areas where we can use informatics. So it's better to call it kind of health informatics. So for years, many years ago, everyone went, we need digital medical records or electronic medical records. Everyone digitized most of what they were doing. Um, it was somewhat successful. I've heard stories about people who write everything on paper and then they give it to the secretary who then types it in and things like that. But we can now use that data to try and prevent things from happening in the first place. And, and prevention is always the best cure. So, so a lot of what we do is trying to find better ways of using all this information which is already available in hospitals to try and spot specific occurrences. There was an example in Boston where, I don't know if it was when it happened or in retrospect they found out, after they introduced a drug, their cardiac arrest rate went up. And given the right tools, you would be able to spot that. But we need bioinformaticians to develop tools which can spot trends people aren't looking for, which is very important. You don't want to go around, wait around until someone says, there's a lot more people having cardiac arrest than we're used to before you do something. You want to catch it quickly. And prevention is a key theme in the next thing I'm going to talk about. This recently came out. There was some people in uh, the UK who used rapid turnaround sequencing to identify which strains of a multiple resistant drug were active in, uh, in a hospital. So multiple resistance is becoming a very large problem. Hospitals have tackled it using infection control and the wash bottles or the antidetergent you come when you come in. But using this, uh, using sequencing, they were able to track exactly which strains were in the hospital and they managed to find the source of the outbreak. So that's a massive step forward and it could save people and it enables people to know what is going on inside the hospital instead of trying so they know before what is what strains are there instead of waiting for people to get ill. Because one of the given bad statistics aside, it's quite likely you're gonna pass away in a hospital. So but most people who are in a hospital are very weak and very susceptible to infection, have a very bad immune system. So you want to stop these things as, as quickly as possible. So, so these are all kind of very good examples of how we can do innovative medicine today and how we can um, use all the knowledge coming out of the research community to do this. 
So the initiative I'm with, which is called the Office of Personalized Medicine, Genomic Medicine, Innovative, something. The initiative at uh, Mount Sinai tries to bring this to Canada. And the key thing about innovative medicine is that you have a lot of people working together who would historically haven't worked together. And a lot of things can happen when you have different groups of people working together. Um, this is one example where one, someone has done a very good job of painting the bike path and someone has done a very good job of putting up bollards, but there clearly hasn't been that much communication between them about what the actual outcome should be. So, so that's why this initiative was created. So it's trying to bring everything together under the same roof and we're working on this motto about giving the right dose, the right medication to the right patient at the right time. And with the key goal of trying to bring down healthcare costs so we can afford it in the future, but also to give patients a better experience in the hospital. So I'm assuming not very many people here like being in waiting rooms or sitting in a doctor's office or waiting for trials. And there are a lot of technical things we could do. So how many people here prefer going to the bank versus doing something online to carry out a transaction? I'm expecting it's most people. So, so we can do these things. I guess this audience is a bit biased when it comes to that. But, um, so, so there's a lot of opportunities, and we really want to put those in place and uh, do it in the context of Canadian socialized medicine. The way we define personalized medicine is based on these four things. So we have access to real-time medical information, so what's going on in the hospital, what's all the information we have about you and uh, can possibly collect. We'll try and find other ways of pulling more information in in the future. Uh, sequencing, so rapid turnaround sequencing. I'm sure it's a bread and butter of most people here. And genetic counseling. So we're of the view that these things are very complex and for people to trust what they result they get back and give them actionable information, we need genetic counseling involved in this. Giving people a 24-page report or 17 megabyte PDF telling you have these homicide variants just doesn't cut it. And the last thing is also education because a lot of physicians don't know necessarily what these things mean. There's a lot of examples of people getting gene type in 23andMe, taking the report and go down to the physician. Just the doctor just goes, no. Um, if you're telling people how they should, or you're prescribing drugs to people, you'd like to be, feel good about what you're doing. People, you don't like to be uncertain about what you tell people. So we need to be able to make doctors and patients feel comfortable with this technology instead of just trying to push them over the edge. So how do we accomplish this? So we're Mount Sinai. It's, we started back in 1923 as a three-bed maternity hospital. Uh, if you go to Yorktown, you can still see the old building. It was created as a uh, hospital for Jewish women, so they could deliver in uh, surroundings which were, uh, had the cultural amenities they would like, so like kosher food and things like that. We're now grown to about around 500 beds, and we are the, with the reference center for, for uh, breast cancer pathology testing. So we have a very effective uh, molecular diagnostic lab, which on current technology processes over 14,000 samples a year. How they do that using existing technology, I don't know, but they, they work 24 7, so they're very dedicated lot. So that's the first bit we have. The next bit we have is something called the uh, genet Clinical Genomic Center. So it's a sequencing service um, where we provide for private and government researchers. Uh, sequencing services using all the usual uh, suspects for sequencing and genotyping. Uh, so we have a rich body of knowledge about how to run these instruments and how to use them in a research setting. So we're now taking that and moving it into uh, the clinical space by being inside the hospital. We also have the Fred A. Littman Family Center for Genetic um, Services. It's a unique service. It's the only adult genetic counseling clinic in Ontario. Uh, we have trained genetic counselors who now help people understand what the genetic meaning of 
mutations are in heart disease and autoimmune disease and similar areas. And the last bit where you guys come in, that we're located in the Toronto Discovery District. So there's a rich body of knowledge and new discoveries coming out of the Toronto area, which can be fed into to clinical use. And we have the manpower we need, and we can find the people we need to actually make this happen. So that is kind of, so we've taken, we've seen we needed those four building blocks. We have the, we have the hospital with the existing systems. We have the genetic counseling. We have the sequencing facility. And we have the, the Toronto uh, research community, including the Lunenfeld Institute, which is inside uh, Mount Sinai Hospital. And using this, we're moving forward with what we call integrated personalized medicine. So our goal is to try and break down a lot of the existing barriers which are there and to make the time from discovery to clinical use much quicker and being able to feed longitudinal data back to government use or drug development. And that way help to face all these problems which people are facing now, which is about how do we do a clinical trial if we don't have enough information on these pages? How do we find out if a drug is working or not? All these things. People are starting to talk about phase four clinical trials, which is what actually happens once the drug gets approved. So we're in a good place. We have all these things we need. Um, so we should just get going. But there are a few challenges in doing these things. The, the first one is introducing change. Anyone who's ever deployed a large piece of software or been in an organizational reorganization knows changing things can be quite hard. We need to work on the education. We have some very good people at the hospital. We have some people from Harvard Medical School and St. Jude, and, but there are not enough of those, so we need to get knowledge out to more people, and especially also at the decision maker level, so people in the province understand that this is a good investment. Then we have the data problem. I was talking to trainees earlier. Clinical is where research was about seven to eight years ago. NGS is coming, everything is breaking, everyone is running around in panic trying to figure out how to manage their data. So we need to find to do, deal with that. Then we have the unique one, which is about privacy and regulation, which you don't have as much in a research setting. So we have to comply to the, the rules of the land, and we have to do things in a way which uh, passes regulation. So changing healthcare. There's been a lot of change over the last 100 years in healthcare. 100 years ago, you had male doctors and female nurses. Now you have female doctors and male nurses. That's my kind of crude view of how unchanged healthcare is. Healthcare is a very old profession. Telling people to do things differently is hard. We also have many silos. So we've, we're facing a challenge there, but through education and communication, we're trying to, hoping to convince people that this is the right thing. If you looked at operational research, you also know there are different ways of optimizing your organization. You can optimize it to try and bring down your cost, um, bring down how well you do something, or your quality, or how flexible you are. So if you're on this side, you're doing, trying to do things as well and as cheap as possible. If you're down on this axis, you're trying to do it as well and as flexible as possible. Which, so the further down you go here, the more it costs. The further away you go from here, the worse it gets. So um, I think I'm sure a lot of people think we're here with healthcare, but it's basically we need to pull these two different ways of working together. A hospital kind of works from a batch mentality, which is you do a lot of things in one go. Uh, no one in the hospital, you've never seen a doctor go over to someone, talk to them a bit, do a bit of surgery on them, give them a few drugs, and then go over to the next patient. You do things in a very uh, uh, batch fashion, whereas research is all about putting a group of people together and getting them to do something good. So we're hoping to bring these two types of thinking together while hopefully still keeping the cost down. And that's why 
this batch mentality is why you kind of feel a bit detached in hospital because you're sitting in queue waiting for the next slot so you can be processed. And that's not a very nice feeling. Education is, is we need different education programs, but coming back to the kind of bioinformatics theme, um, it would be hard to quickly enough educate enough people. So we need pieces of software which captures knowledge and, and can in, pass best practices on to different hospitals. So we need to develop tools which, uh, submit, which includes best practices and knowledge and supports doctors so every single hospital doesn't have to be, turn into a research institution. It's fine if you're Baylor, Harvard, or any of these others and you have 20 postdocs lined up for every patient. But even how much we would like to make every patient a research project, we're not going to get the funding for it. So we need tools which can make this process more efficient. I've already talked about data. Um, it's becoming a big problem in research, but in hospitals it's an even bigger problem because there's a lot more constraints about how you're allowed to store data that needs to be encrypted. So I did a back of the envelope calculation. So if we're going to store te three terabytes for 10 years, which is our privacy requirement, or being able to reproduce data, it would cost us half a million dollars. And so the costing model just doesn't work. I don't think we're going to have to keep run folders, but the, the amount of cost to have the clinical data storage is astonishing. So we need to find better ways of using less data or smarter data and convince people that we don't have to keep every single piece of data to, keep, uh, to comply. Privacy. Um, in Canada, we have the Personal Health Information Protection Act. Um, it's not such a big problem because it's a very clear set of rules. Don't lose people's data. If you don't do that, you're fine. So as long as we stick to the rules, we're fine. Regulation. I've worked in regulated areas before. I've worked in banks. Um, we're mainly dealing with these organizations. There's the OLA, which is the Ontario Lab Accreditation, CLIA, CAP, and the FDA. They're not complicated, it's just a lot of tedious work. Um, regulation is about having procedure. Procedure is about saying what you're going to do, doing what you said you would do, and document that you did what you said you would do. Um, so it involves fun things like writing these kind of documents which says, if we have a new user, we'll give them access to the system until we revoke the access. And then you document that, and when you give someone access to the system, you write down and who approved it. So it's just a lot of bookkeeping. I said there is a large gap in software at the moment. That's being, there's a lot of industrial people down in the US as always. They're trying to build a lot of tools to solve the problems we have. The problem is they try to treat us like we're the 53rd state, and we're not. Um, so we, there's a lot of, sort of informatics tools which would help us greatly, which we cannot use. So there's people coming out with solutions which are either on AWS or uh, Google Cloud Engine, and they're kind of, for legal reasons, they're off limits for us. We can't take uh, Canadian clinical data and send it to the US. So that kind of makes my job a bit trickier, so we have to go back to the kind of old days and install big compute farms. But hopefully I'm hearing things about a Ontario Health Cloud, or I think everyone wants one, so I'm my hopes are up, but at the moment, you have to, to run your own infrastructure, which is a pain. So that's a bit about what we in personalized medicine is and how we envision it. I'll try and explain a bit about what it means specifically for us. So we have a human exome pipeline. This is kind of standard stuff for most people. Um, the doing exomes in the clinic is fairly similar to doing it in research. There's just a lot of more bookkeeping and checks. So once we've done an exome, we end up with a list of variants. The low-hanging fruit for us is pharmacogenomics. So similar to the warfarin example, if you have a certain genotype, we can tell you which drug we want. This is fairly straightforward, and it's kind of the first area we're moving into. The next one we're trying to tackle is 
trying to get rid of capillary. It seems like since 2006, my theme of my life how, has been, how do we get rid of capillary? It seems to be the technology just sticks around. And we have the clinical diagnostics, but none is based on capillary. They run a small number of samples. They called mutations using classical tools like mutation surveyor. And the biggest workload, or holding them up, is that they find about 1 to 20 novel variants per week which to most people here is a very small number. To them, it's a huge number, because every time they find one, they have to do a literature search, they have to go through various databases, they have to find out what this variant means and document it. So when you come optimistically to a clinical person and say, I've reduced it to only 2,000 variants, they go very pale. They would like it to be 10. So, so there is a huge gap at the moment between how much we can filter variants and how much a single person can handle. So how do we do with these things? Because there's a lot of approaches at the moment for filtering in the bioinformatics community, but how do you do it if you only have one person? The thousand genomes is a fantastic resource, but not so much if you're just one person. How do we know what this means exactly to you? What if variants are interesting? One one solution I've heard, a major US institution used, they have a time stopwatch. So they give people two hours to analyze the variants, and then they're done. And that's one way of getting around it. Most filtering tools out there, are never, I'm sure there's a lot of people who put a lot of good time into them, but they are fairly crude still, at least if we're going to put them into a clinic. So other problems. You can't just put any software you want on a hospital PC because they're monitored and they're, you have to go through change management to change them. So at the moment, Excel is kind of the default factor standard for dealing with these things. What do we do with all these variants of unknown significance? And then there's also the big one about incidental finding. What should you tell people? If you have the whole genome, we can tell you all kinds of good things. You're going to be blind by your 65. It's not things people want to know. So there's a lot of discussion about exactly what do you want to feed back. So people are trying to retrofit uh, kind of panel-based sequencing on exome sequencing. So we'll do your whole exome, but we'll only tell you about the small bit. So there's a lot of interesting things going on out there. So that's where we are with exome sequencing. The other thing we're also looking at is trying to predict trends in, in the hospital. So. We've, uh, over a number of years, we've been collecting clinical data and we're working to plug into the EMR so we can pull out information. So we've been a uh, resource so we can pull out information saying, we can enable doctors to ask questions like, how many revisits do we have from a patient which is given this drug? So we've, we're starting to work on this kind of business intelligence side of, of clinical care. And then it's uh, bootstrap again. It's your friend. Um, so we've, we're trying to work. This is an area we're actively developing on, but it's, it's a very interesting area. And it, I think it's, it's not something people often think about when they say bioinformatics, but there's a large kind of business intelligence side to healthcare. So what is my biggest worry at the moment? So because it's a billion dollar market, there's a lot of commercial players in play at the moment. And we're kind of back to the human genome days. Everyone is trying to build their own closed solution or trying to patent things or build commercial databases. So it's important that we all continue to keep all these resources open, because otherwise it's not going to get cheaper if we have all these known human variants locked up in various databases. A lot of these products which are coming out are based on, on research databases. And what people do, which I don't understand, they take them in and then they try to make them clinical grade. And it's kind of equivalent of taking Wikipedia and trying to make a commercial version and then putting 10 people and curating it. It just doesn't work. So we need, a, we need an open effort so we can know what the human variation landscape looks like and, and uh, down to the individual person. 
So, we have a number of challenges moving forward. As I said, how this is going to work in Canada is still a bit open to discussion. We're trying to short circuit it by saying this is how it should be done. Variant annotation could be improved. We need better databases. The US is trying to push ClinVar. So I'm hoping that they will not fall over this physical cliff because it will make our life much easier. They're kind of the driving engine on this. So if they cut 20% of the NIH budget, this is going to become much harder. We need to be clear about how we, what and what we tell people when we analyze their genomes. And then we need to show that this is actually a worthwhile investment. Cheap sequencing is becoming very cheap, but it's not free. So if we're doing it, we have to show that we're actually making people feel better or abusing less drugs. So that's where we're now. Moving forward, things are going to be very interesting. You have the uh, Duke Nukem Forever of sequencing. You have the Iron Torrent, which should hopefully come out in a year or so. You have, if anyone's read about the Snyder paper, about the Snyderome, they've used not just sequencing, but a huge number of other metrics of how your health works. And people are struggling with this, with the how to integrate ENCODE data. It's the same problem. We're going to have very many different data sources and data types and trying to bring those together in a comprehensible way. Um, we've kind of had it easy with variants. I think compared to these more, more complicated data sources. So I think it's going to be a very interesting future, and I truly believe that innovative medicine is going to improve it, because if we don't, the economy is going to melt down, or we're going to have to treat less, less people. So that's where we are. Questions? I think most hospitals have some um, systems in place. Um, I think most countries, and they still seem to be scattered, and they seem to be an impossible problem to solve how to get them to talk to each other. But given how long you live, you're spending a very little amount of time in the hospital. So there's also the whole thing about how do you know what people are doing when they're not in the hospital. So there's people, there's initiative like Quantify Me and things like that where people enter data and what's going on. And that's a very interesting approach about trying to, to keep in touch with your patients while they're not in the hospital. And it kind of comes back to the whole internet banking idea that, that you try to stay in, uh, have communication between the patient and the hospital even when they're outside the hospital or when they're at their uh, family doctor and things like that. Has, has that been sort of pioneered? Do you have these on, is there a system for patients to go online and let's say... Uh, There's a lot of, a lot of the patient, a lot of the, um, the patient associations have created a lot of initiatives and there's, there's things like patients like me. So people, because of privacy reasons, people are very worried about doing it top down. So very, a lot of it is people's own initiatives, so they give up their own information. But, um, Patients like me is a very good example of, of patients helping patients because that's another, if you can cut the healthcare system out of the loop completely, which I don't know if it's a good idea, but uh, that will save money as well. So people can talk about their, their, how they're feeling, how, what their pain level is that day and things like that. So, so they've had great success in pulling information out of that system. Yeah, um, from the hospital's point of view, uh, it's, we prefer to give people, doctors prefer to give people actionable information, so things they can do something about. Um, 
I'm still a bit open how useful it is. And um, I, the thing I always turn, uh, think about is smoking as an example, because you can tell people to death that smoking is bad, but they'll still smoke. Um, so telling people what the risk factors is for various things in a way they don't understand, I don't think it's, it's that useful, but it's, it, I don't know, people are in charge of their own lives is my view, but that's kind of, it's not the official view of the hospital. <laughs> So um, I think the main, the main fit, Catherine Semenovich, who is my boss, our main focus is autoimmune disease. Uh, but the other half of the question is, I think you're going to go from to targeted panels to begin with. Because at the moment, you're trying to go from one gene. So the best way to get there is probably to go to two genes and then more genes. Uh, because if you do a whole genome, everything just, or a whole exome, everything just breaks. So. Yeah, because when you do these things, you have, you have to validate them. So trying to validate an entire exome would be a tremendously huge job. You need to validate every single variant. So. And probably lots of actionable drugs that you have drugs maybe available. Yeah, so we want to get, we, we're not just doing it because we can, we want to do it because it will change something. Well, it, the, that's, the, that's the problem and benefit of Excel. It's extremely flexible, and I don't know why no one can build something that does what Excel does and scales at the same time. But uh, it's mostly for exome sequencing in the moment. So there are systems in place for the more classical uh, um, capillary sequencing, but at the moment, even the large institutions when they do an exome, what you end up, the, the goal seems to be to generate a file which fits in a spreadsheet because that's the easiest way to give it for someone to review. So that presentation issue, I, I, I thought you were referring to the analytics. Well, I've seen some graphs and things in the world, but yeah. <laughs> it's amazing what people can do with Excel once in a while. 